When we talk about ourselves, what are we talking about? What is you? Is it your body? Is it your brain? Is it your consciousness? Is it the feeling you have of looking out through your eyes and the feeling you have of being inside your head? Is it the thing in between the two headphones right now that is processing the somewhat monotone sounds coming in? Thinking thoughts and feeling sensations. Are you a body or a brain? Are you both? Is there a soul? These concepts and questions like them generally refer to a term in philosophy known as the self. What makes you, you? This feeling that we have of being stable over time as an individual. What we associate with our sense of being, what makes us feel like a person. One question you can ask about the self, if you believe a self even exists, is does the self remain stable over time or does it change over time? And if it changes over time drastically, are you still the same person you were yesterday or a month ago or 10 years ago? Or are you a different person, a different self? People have been debating this question for millennia. Here's Plutarch, ancient historian, examining what has come to be known as the ship of Theseus. He says, quote, The ship wherein Theseus and the youth of Athens returned had thirty oars and was preserved by the Athenians down even to the time of Demetrius Phalerius. For they took away the old planks as they decayed, putting in new and stronger timber in their place, insomuch that this ship became a standing example among the philosophers for the logical question of things that grow, one side holding that the ship remained the same, and the other contending that it was not the same. End quote. So you can imagine a ship that goes out on a journey and then comes back to its home port and some of the pieces are old and decayed, the wood needs to be replaced, the sails have holes in them, and these repairs are made. And every time the ship goes out on a journey and comes back, new pieces are put in and the old ones are taken out until eventually the ship is entirely different pieces than it was when it was constructed. So there's not a single piece of wood or a single sail or a single piece of it that existed when the ship was first created. So the question is, aside from how do I know so little about the pieces and design of a ship, the question is, after replacing all of those parts, is that ship the same ship, or is it a different ship over the years? Is there a certain point in time where you can say, okay, now enough pieces have been put in and replaced, where now we can say this is a different entity? And of course, now we apply this dilemma and this paradox of identity to our own inner lives. How can you be you if you is gone? I'm sure everyone's heard something along the lines of physically they say that every cell deteriorates every few years and cells are constantly being regenerated so that something like every few years you have an entirely new set of physical cells, physical substance kind of similar to the ship of Theseus. Now, I don't know how true that is or what the science behind cell death and regeneration is, but the truth is, it doesn't matter. Think about the perspective of consciousness. 
there's no way you're the same person you were at age three from the perspective of consciousness. So it would be safe to assume that even your mental world is changing constantly. Are you the same person who woke up today compared to the person who woke up yesterday? Most people would say probably. But how about the person who wakes up in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years? Surely you've changed radically from 20 years ago, and surely you will change radically in 20 years in the future. That would be kind of weird if you were literally thinking the exact same way and experiencing things exactly the same way all throughout your life. So we're pontificating here and things are getting philosophical. And you might be thinking, who cares about these sorts of questions? It doesn't matter. I feel like I'm the same person I was. And this is all just mumbo jumbo. But Kind of the point here for the purpose of this episode is just to get thinking about how hard it is to actually understand yourself. If this ship of Theseus stuff has any weight, and if the fact that our physical bodies are always changing and our mental states are always changing, and we're not the same people we were 10 years ago and so on and so forth, it's really hard to understand yourself. It's almost impossible. Things are shifting and changing, and sometimes it's hard to locate what we are thinking and feeling. New information is coming in. Old information is fighting to cling on inside our brains. Our bodies are changing. The environment around us is shifting. And this is all happening every day. And we sometimes aren't even aware that it's going on. So think about how hard it is to actually know yourself. Really know yourself. And then apply that to somebody else. How hard is it to actually, truly understand somebody else? Interestingly enough, that brings us back to history. That's what history is trying to accomplish. We're trying to understand the past by understanding the people who lived through it. How they lived, what they were feeling, what they were thinking, what they were doing. Humans. People. This is history. Nobody cares what the lizards and the birds thought about Julius Caesar and the fall of the Roman Republic although I'm sure they had an interesting take, a bird's eye view maybe, but we care about the people. So now we start to realize the immensity of the task at hand. If it's so hard to understand ourselves, how hard is it going to be to understand somebody else, much less somebody else who's been dead for 2,000 years? So how do we do it? How do we really understand others, especially others who are long dead and long gone? Could you learn what it's truly like to be somebody else? Could someone or something else learn to be you? Over the last few weeks, I've been thinking a lot about a sort of cult classic short story it's called Learning to Be Me by Greg Egan. The story takes place in a alternate world or a future world where humans are capable of achieving immortality. The way they do it is they stick what's called a jewel, not the jewel that middle schoolers are using to get high, but Think of a chip that gets put in the brain, and over the course of your life, the jewel learns how to be you. Once that jewel knows everything there is to know, you switch over 
and your organic body dies, but your consciousness, your identity, you live on inside this jewel, which gets placed into another body. Greg Egan describes how it works in the famous opening paragraph of the story. He says, quote, I was six years old when my parents told me that there was a small, dark jewel inside my skull learning to be me. Microscopic spiders had woven a fine golden web through my brain so that the jewel's teacher could listen to the whisper of my thoughts. The jewel itself eavesdropped on my senses and read the chemical messages carried in my bloodstream. It saw, heard, smelled, tasted, and felt the world exactly as I did, while the teacher monitored its thoughts and compared them with my own. Whenever the jewel's thoughts were wrong, the teacher, faster than thought, rebuilt the jewel slightly, altering it this way and that, seeking out the changes that would make its thoughts correct. Why? So that when I could no longer be me, the jewel could do it for me. End quote. The question, as you're reading the story, quickly becomes, once that switch gets made, is the jewel the real person? Is it the real me? Or is it only the jewel that has learned how to be me? The story overall is a very interesting dissection of personal identity and consciousness, and it reminds you of that ship of Theseus paradox that we talked about earlier. And the main character in the story that the story is sort of narrated from is someone who has a lot of questions about this whole jewel business. He is somewhat of a doubter that the jewel could ever actually learn how to be him. Early on in the story, he talks about being with his girlfriend as a teenager and how even if the jewel was in his brain learning all of the thoughts and the neurons that were firing and all of the things that made up his experience, there's something about the way he's feeling it that the jewel could never truly understand. He says, quote, Spending warm nights on the beach with Eva, I couldn't believe that a mere machine could ever feel the way I did. I knew full well that if my jewel had been given control of my body, it would have spoken the very same words as I had and executed with equal tenderness and clumsiness my every awkward caress. But I couldn't accept that its inner life was as rich, as miraculous, as joyful as mine. Sex, however pleasant, I could accept as a purely mechanical function. But there was something between us, or so I believed, that had nothing to do with lust, nothing to do with words, nothing to do with any tangible action of our bodies that some spy in the sand dunes with parabolic microphone and infrared binoculars might have discerned. After we made love, we'd gaze up in silence at the handful of visible stars, our souls conjoined in a secret place that no crystalline computer could ever hope to reach in a billion years of striving. Later, he says, Sure, the jewel could pass the fatuous Turing test. No outside observer could tell it from a human, but that didn't prove that being a jewel felt the same as being human. End quote. The main character continues having this crisis of identity, worrying that when his consciousness gets switched over to the jewel, he will actually die and no longer exist. And he's also thinking about the hypocrisy of thinking that way because of the way that he's changed over the course of his life and he's discarded his old sense of self that he no longer identifies with and he seems to do this all the time. He says, quote, I'd lie awake for hours every night trying to convince myself one way or the other but the longer I dwelt upon the issues, the more tenuous and elusive they became. 
who was I anyway? What did it mean that I was still alive when my personality was utterly different from that of two decades before? My earlier selves were as good as dead. I remembered them no more clearly than I remembered contemporary acquaintances. Yet this loss caused me only the slightest discomfort. Maybe the destruction of my organic brain would be the merest hiccup compared to all the changes that I'd been through in my life so far. Or maybe not. Maybe it would be exactly like dying. End quote. The story goes on, and there's a lot of cool twists, one in particular that is very interesting, I won't spoil. I definitely recommend you go out and read the story. I couldn't find a PDF online, so I couldn't link to it. I think you can listen to it on YouTube, or you can just buy Greg Egan's book of short stories, but anyway, at the end of the story, the switch is made, and the main character is now the jewel version of the main character. And it turns out that all of these humans are dying after all. The jewel is a separate identity from the person who came before it. Because you can simulate all of the neurons firing, and you can simulate all of the brain matter doing things, and you can simulate all of the thoughts and the emotions and the feelings you want, but you can't simulate what it's like to actually be someone. Even for a brain microchip that has been learning everything about you for decades, it's not possible to truly be able to experience someone else's inner life. In the last few lines of the story, the new jeweled main character is trying to feel sorry for the person that he was based on who is now dead, but he can't really seem to understand it. He says, quote, Somehow he simply isn't real to me. I know my brain was modeled on his, giving him a kind of causal primacy, but in spite of that, I think of him now as a pale, insubstantial shadow. After all, I have no way of knowing if his sense of himself, his deepest inner life, his experience of being, was in any way comparable to my own. End quote. Okay, so, learning to be me It's a great philosophical story that I recommend, but what's the point? I think that one of the lessons of the story is that you can never really truly know what it's like to be somebody else. Not even a microchip planted in the brain can know what it's truly like to experience being the way that someone else does. So when talking about someone else, you can't experience what they experience. You'll never know what it's truly like to be them, to see colors the way that they do, to taste coffee the way they do, to get the specific feelings they get when they sit on the beach or when they see the sunset or reminisce about their childhood, or capture a fleeting memory. So we can't truly know what it's like to be someone else, but that's also why it's so important to try. Again, not too many people are worried about the history of lizards and birds. So if this is about human beings and their happiness and their well-being, it's actually really difficult to learn about them. It's hard, and it requires dedication and commitment and a rigorous process of historical analysis. I mean, this is is the importance of history, and especially oral history. It's really the closest thing we have to 
trying and being able to understand what it might have been like to be somebody else. And it's only a tiny sliver of the actual experience that people went through. But it's so important because that's all we have. So to apply this to what's been going on over the last few weeks, if we want to get to a better place together, we have to apply those same historical concepts. But sometimes it's as simple as listening, really listening, not just letting someone else talk and waiting to interject. As we've seen, you can't really know what it's like to be someone else. We can get close, we can really try to understand, and we can develop a pretty good sense of what's going on, kind of like putting together a puzzle, but the missing piece is always going to be the real experience of the person we're talking to or studying or watching on the news that we can't ever truly know without actually being them what it's really like to be them day in and day out. So when someone else or a group of individuals tells you they're in trouble or they're hurting or they're in pain or they need help or they're being mistreated or they want reform and they're talking about it or they're speaking with their actions, then you listen because you don't know what it's like to be them. But listening, and then helping, is the first step. Getting to a place of empathy, and compassion, and reason, and truth, and happiness, and all of the things that we value, starts with listening, and trying to understand. Learning to be you. 